And uh, I'd like to declare this meeting um, open. It's Thursday, March 11, 2021. Uh, Coast Women in Business is honored to have podcasters Steve Lubetkin, Vicki Hammerstedt, and Doug Nunn um, speaking along with other um, honored guests. And I'll um, let um, Catherine take it over. I'll be in the background. If anybody has any technical issues, please um, just uh, uh, put your, um, your question in chat. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Again, so this topic today is how to use podcasting to market your business, creative work, or a good cause. I'm Catherine Marshall, a member of the Coast Women in Business Steering Committee, and I want to welcome everyone. I'm encouraging everyone to use chat. A uh, couple of things here. Uh, first of all, I'd encourage everyone to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself through chat. Uh, feel free to put your website up or your email address. You can either address everyone and say, well, first of all, address everyone and say hi to everyone so everyone knows who's here um, and say a little bit about your business. And then, um, then we'll also, you can speak to individuals, make appointments while everybody, while all this is going on, you can do that. Um, but we'll also use chat for mm -hmm. questions. And uh, we're going to be hearing, uh, Catherine's going to be moderating the, the meeting and um, we'll be collecting questions and then ask them during the Q&A. All right, so we're having a few more people come in. I see Erica Fielder, Cynthia Wall, uh, Teresa, hello. Clara, welcome. Ahulani, welcome. All right, Allison DeGrassi, and we have a few more folks here. All right. Um, see, we're not going to do introductions at this point, Catherine. Did you want to suggest that we uh, people just say a few words, or how would you like this to go? Well, I was thinking we could go right into the program and then uh, because we we have people kind of trickling in here and that way the speakers can speak. And then at the end, we're going to have, uh, you know, we'll have at least 15 or 20 minutes, I think. Okay. So, yes, and we'll, we'll do our, our usual program that we stick in the in the beginning. We'll put we'll tack that on. The <laughs> there we go. Since we so, have three speakers <clears throat> from all over the place. So. Well, uh, this topic came to the fore because actually several of us have been thinking about doing podcasting ourselves, and we had the usual questions, like if you have a company, how can you use a podcast to market your company? Can you make money for just from podcasting? Is that an income stream that's viable? Uh, if you're a writer or creative person, how do you use podcasting to market your books or your artwork or whatever you're creating? If you work in a nonprofit or you're trying to raise money for a good cause, can you use podcasting to do that? So I'm going to kick it off with our first speaker, which is Steve Beckin. Steve is a very well-known podcaster, and he also does video programming, and he's the managing partner of the Lubetkin Media Companies, which produces news video content for media outlets. Steve serves as news director of its content division, statebroadcastnews.com. In 2012, the Philadelphia Business Journal named Steve one of its social media stars, and he really is, for his successful work producing audio and video podcasts. Steve is the co-author of the book, The Business of Podcasting. How to Take Your Podcasting Passion from the Personal to the Professional with Toronto-based podcasting pioneer Donna Papacosta. He also appears frequently on podcasts and internet stream TV shows discussing the value of web-based audio and video content. His broadcast experience includes digital recording, editing and post-production of long-form digital audio and video programming, including HD videography for recorded and live-streamed internet and broadcast use. He holds an MBA from the University of Phoenix and a BA in Spanish and philosophy from Monmouth College, 
West Long Branch, New Jersey. Steve is accredited in public relations by the Public Relations Society of America, PRSA, and is a member of PRSA's prestigious College of Fellows. So Steve can tell us a lot about podcasting. And 15 minutes is not much time. You could maybe go 20. <laughs> I will talk fast, Catherine. Thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks to both Catherines. I'm, I'm often on uh, programs where there's another Steve and we say, uh, two Steves, no waiting. So I guess today <laughs> it's uh, two Catherines, no waiting. Um, so it's great to be here with you. Um, I like to tell people I have been creating podcasts since I was a teenager. And if you look at me, you know that that was a very long time ago. Um, uh, when I was about uh, 14 or 15, I was, uh, I had the opportunity to spend an afternoon in a mock radio station uh, at the military base where my father taught in the Signal Corps uh, training center. And um, I learned how to work the control board and how to announce and how to play commercials and queue up records back in the days when records were vinyl. And uh, I left that, that experience bitten by the radio bug and I immediately went home and made myself a pretend radio station in my parents basement with a, a, a turntable a microphone and a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and um, it's odd but I found over the years that when I mentioned that experience to people a lot of other people did exactly the same thing and then we ended up going into college radio um, I'm paralleling my experience with that of other people. Um, my first stop when I got to college was the college radio station, um, and they gave me a radio show. Um, from there, I graduated to commercial radio, where I was a production engineer and then a, a news announcer and reporter. Um, but the, the reality of life in broadcast radio, and it's the same today, it's even worse today, is you can either be on the radio or you can buy groceries, but you can't really do both. Um, the economics of broadcasting are such that you spend a lot of years running around the country, um, working at small stations and not making a lot of money. And I chose not to go that route. I ended up in corporate public relations uh, where I used my radio skills uh, as much as I could back in the days of analog recordings. Um, when we would have a special event or a press conference or something like that, I'd make recordings and then I would try to leverage those recordings with the broadcast news media. And sometimes we were able to get them to use our tape, sometimes we didn't. But you flash forward about 30 years, and when I exited my corporate life and was looking for a new chapter, um, I initially thought I was going to be a PR consultant uh, and a counselor to the C-suite. But there's a lot of competition in that space. And uh, as luck would have it, around 2004, 2005, when podcasting was just coming up over the horizon, like um, uh, social media today, we called it new media back then. Um, my wife happened to hear an NPR feature, an early one on podcasting and said, you know, with your radio experience, you should be looking at this pod podcasting thing. And I started focusing more on podcasting and realized it would be a wonderful uh, communications channel for businesses to educate their audiences about their work. Um, and I set about learning how to do all the things I knew how to do in the analog world, because remember, I grew up editing audio on magnetic recording tape with a razor blade. Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember uh, doing that, uh, but you didn't have a lot of margin of error like you have with digital. Um, and so I learned how to do a digital editing and I began to accumulate the tools I needed, software and hardware and even digital recording devices. And uh, the book that Donna and I wrote, The uh, Business of Podcasting, um, stems from the experience where I found myself producing podcasts for corporate clients and trying to make them sound as, as good as or nearly as good as what you would hear on NPR or the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, good quality, long form audio. Uh, but I found myself unable to find other podcasters who had the gear necessary to cover assignments when I was double booked. And we realized there was a, an opportunity for podcast professionals to leverage their skills and make some money. But it isn't the way that most people think you make money from podcasting. You don't make money, or at least Donna and I found, you don't make money from podcasting by becoming a famous celebrity podcast host. Um, the large media companies kind of have that market locked up. There's going to be very, very few podcast professionals who break through that. 
because there are literally millions and millions of podcasts. But where you can break through is having the skill set to produce and edit uh, audio programs for your clients and make the money from the production uh, services aspect of it. So that's kind of where we focused uh, and that's where Donna was focused. And uh, over the years, we've been able to produce a lot of corporate podcasts of very high quality for people. Um, within a couple of years of starting the podcasting business, we started getting questions from people about video. And I wasn't really prepared for video. I'm not one of these build it and they will come people who um, invests a lot of uh, money in buying equipment before I know that it's going to get used and it's going to get paid for. Uh, and so, um, I, again, my wife said to me, what's keeping you awake about the business? And I said, you know, I'm worried somebody's going to call me and say, we need you to do a video tomorrow and I don't have any gear and I'll be running around like a crazy person trying to get the gear. And she said, well, you know, why don't you price out some gear and, and get yourself some used equipment so you can get started. As luck would have it, I had a friend who was retiring and he had a, a side hustle from his day job where he produced uh, wedding and bar mitzvah videos. And he was retiring, shutting down the business. And I said to him, what are you going to do with your cameras? And he said, I'm thinking of selling them. Are you interested? And I said, I'll be over tonight. And that's when we bought the first uh, video gear. It got us in the door. And, you know, I crossed my fingers when I wrote the check because I didn't have someone ready uh, to pay me to to do video. But within a couple of weeks, we got our first video gig and that paid for the equipment. I went, OK, we dodged that bullet. And uh, then we began, you know, gradually gearing up and getting better and better at producing video. I, you know, flash forward to the pandemic times. Um, we have been doing for about 12 years some podcasts and some live conference video for a public policy news website here in New Jersey called NJ Spotlight. It's now affiliated with the New Jersey PBS station um, and network. Um, but when they started, it was a website with a lot of expertise. The people who started it were uh, print journalists who had deep, deep expertise in New Jersey state government news and public policy. And they would do um, these live roundtable conferences with experts on the different issues, whether it's education or healthcare or state government, budget, things like that, energy. And we did podcasts of those live events. Last March, just before the pandemic uh, struck, about almost a year to the day that we're speaking today, um, I said to the event producer, you know, we're going to get shut down soon and we need to have a plan B for these live events. And he said to me, I'm not ready for that. We're going to keep trying to do them live as long as we can. And literally a couple of days later, he called me and said, I just got the word we can't do any more live events. So how do we do this virtually? Because the events were a moneymaker for NJ Spotlight. And um, we mapped out a plan, which we're using even now. And later this afternoon, Eastern time, we'll be doing another live stream event from my studio here. We get uh, up to eight people on a remote. We put them into a Zoom-like environment, but it's a little bit fancier than Zoom. And we produce these live streams. So the business has changed rather dramatically um, over the last 15, 16 years that I've been doing it. But uh, we've managed to adapt um, and um, uh, you know, be able to run the business and be flexible and adapt to the changing needs of the clients who are now demanding a lot more remote uh, video and audio work. Uh, we do no in-person stuff. We haven't done an in-person recording since uh, last March. And um, it's, uh, it's just been an interesting journey and we've adapted to it, but we think there's definitely some money that people can make and there's ways that it can be used to uh, persuade people to use your products and services. So I'll stop there and let somebody else start talking and um, see if you have any questions. Thanks. Yes, just a reminder, please put your questions in the chat and we'll get to them after everybody speaks. I know I have a few questions already. So next we're going to Vicki Hammerstedt, architect and director for the Berkeley Advanced Media Institute at the School of Journalism at UC Berkeley. I think that's the grad school, right, Vicki? It is. Yes. Uh, Vicki is an entrepreneur with a passion for all things digital. Mm -hmm. 
She launched the school in 2011. She has had an eclectic career as a technology teacher, developer of a charter school, co-founder of an e-commerce company, and business director in the telecom industry. Currently, she designs and produces multimedia training programs and courses, bringing the latest technologies and innovations in digital storytelling to career professionals throughout the world. When not recruiting savvy, smart industry leaders and academics as partners to support new media programming, she can be found bicycle touring or beekeeping. So what don't we know about podcasting, Vicki, that we need to know before we can get started even? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Catherine. And um, everybody, thank you all for coming today. So I'm going to do a screen share here. There we go. And let's see, I'm going to do share like this. Oops, nope, that's not what I want to do. Sorry, guys, I want to present. Ooh, there we have it. All right. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, to help you think about what do you need to know before you start a podcast. Um, so I started uh, the UC Berkeley. Um, uh, the, the, I started, I didn't start UC Berkeley. I'm sorry. I didn't start the graduate school of journalism either. Um, I started working at UC Berkeley about 10 years ago. And when I came into the graduate school of journalism, um, I thought, you know, there are a lot of people who want to understand the types of things that the journalist use in the, um, but don't have enough time to go to graduate school. And so um, I went to the dean and I said, could we, you know, could I have a year? Could I try to develop a program? Call it whatever you want, executive education, continuing education, but let's produce the type of content that um, professionals would want to know that has to do with producing digital content to digital platforms. I'm gonna put this over here. And uh, he said, sure, go ahead. You have a year, uh, don't lose any money. See what you can do about it. You're gonna have to charge people. And I said, well, of course we are. You know, this is, uh, this is UC Berkeley. We're a public institution. We got to figure out how to do this. So um, I started the Berkeley Advanced Media Institute. And over the years, um, it's grown quite uh, considerably. And um, one of the courses that we produce is um, about uh, is a training program on uh, for professionals on how to start your own and how to develop your own podcast. But one of the other things we did a couple of years ago is so many people were coming to us and saying, can you help me produce a podcast? And we were like, well, well we kind of know how to do that. And yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And so the interest, and we only did this for about a year because what I realized was that um, we're, very, we're a very small group at the Berkeley Advanced Media Institute. And one of the things that we realized was producing podcasts took a lot of our energy and a lot of our direction away from what we really were good at and what we really wanted to do, which was um, train people in uh, digital media content production. But one thing that I did learn uh, through this process was that there were a lot of people who didn't know when they came to do a podcast, they actually didn't understand what that meant and they didn't know the right questions to ask. And or where to begin. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So, oh, let's see. Okay, let's come back here. All right. So when you're thinking about, okay, how to start a podcast, you wanna know where do I begin? And one of the things that I always say to people is, let's start with what is the purpose of your podcast? And I know you're in business um, and you probably have an idea around, um, you know, I have this business, I have this expertise. And so I wanna share this with uh, my audience. And one of the things I always ask is, could you describe this to me? Um, is this a general interest? Are you gonna promote your product? 
um, you know, I'm in the Berkeley, I'm, I'm in UC Berkeley, and we have a lot of people who like to do things around science and explain science. Um, and who's your audience? Like, who do you want to tell this story to? But one of the things that I always ask people to do is give me a summary of your podcast. Can you do this in less than 30 seconds? And the thing that you want to do here is practice practice this. It's, it's often a, um, if it's done properly and um, you can use it, you can use it later on um, when you're trying to promote your podcast. But I have an example from um, when a, uh, from a good friend, Anna Sale, who's the creator of Death, Sex, and Money, um, who has actually taught for Berkeley AMI many times. And Anna Sale started her podcast, I think, in 2014 with WNYC, and it was the number one podcast on iTunes um, when it came out. And if you ask Anna what um, the podcast is about, and she says, the things we think about a lot and need to talk about more. And the interesting thing is, well, what does that mean? Well, the great thing about how she describes her podcast and um, it set her course and it helped her decide these are the kind of things that um, we're going to talk about things that nobody else really wants to talk about. And, we're, and it let her um, build on that and continue to have a podcast now for six, oh, over six years. Oh, wait, what year? Seven years. <laughs> seven years. So again, the next thing, you know, that I ask people about is who is your target audience? Um, and generally, when I'm asking people about who, who is your target audience, we're asking them, why would they be interested? And why would they care? All right. Podcasting takes a lot of work um, to put one together. And um, a good podcast um, you know, will attract listeners, but it's really important to know who you want this podcast to go to. Do you want it to be, is this to your, um, is this to your constituency, the people that you serve through your business? Um, are you looking for a broader audience? You know, why do you want to do this? So, so that's one of the, uh, again, a primary question. The next thing I ask people is what is the format? Um, because the format actually will dictate a lot of things that are going to come later on. And, um, you know, most people in business are going to do something that's nonfiction. And, but still, there's lots of different ways to look at podcasts and lots of different ways to um, produce these and put these together. So, well, this is an example of a podcast. Um, like the Truth Podcast, which is fiction, has a lot of different people. It is a, it's a fairly high um, production value. Um, Doug Gloves Movies Podcast, this is an example of a podcast where it's a couple comedians um, in their basement talking um, and sharing information, which is a much lower production value. But when I talk about production value, I want to talk about it's not like the value of, it's not like your value as a, as a business owner or your value as a, um, as a uh, podcaster. It's really about what is, what is the time, what are the resources that are needed and um, in order to make your podcast, because that's gonna be really important to you. I'm, I'm sure that you all, you know, have a li limited amount of money that you wanna spend on this. Um, so, uh, this just actually describes a little bit more about production value and the, sp the spectrum of it. So putting this in perspective, perhaps of um, podcasts that you're aware of, um, the Moth or the TED Radio Hour, you know, those are very low production values because those are already shows that are being produced for another purpose and they're taking them and they're repurposing them and making them podcasts. On the very high end, where it takes a lot more resources and time, are things like S-Town, um, Wolverine, or um, other types of shows that have um, lots of people involved, 
um, perhaps going um, somewhere on site to record people, hiring stringers, um, you know, um, studio work, creating uh, long narratives, a lot of script writing, a lot of editing. So um, that those, of course, are going to take a lot more resources and a lot more time to produce. So one of the simplest and the, the lower production value um, are, of course, monologues, where you have a single speaker, somebody's going to get on, you're going to talk about something that you're very familiar with. Um, and you just basically um, need a microphone and um, a good way to, you know, record high quality audio. And there you have your podcast. Some you know, examples are books on tape or um, cooking podcasts where just one person talking about um, something that they know well. Something that's a little bit more higher production if you're thinking about, oh, I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna interview people. So you could have two people talking, um, you have prepared questions, there's somebody doing the interview and it's really driven by, for example, you as the host, you as the narrator, and you're doing most of the work. You know, it does take some time, of course, and it does take some resources to find the appropriate people that you're going to interview, set up those interviews. Right now, most everything's being done remotely, a little bit easier. You're not, you know, having to bring them into a studio or work on how you're going to coordinate that interview in person. Um, but it does add some other complexities to it. Um, and, um, but so it becomes a little bit um, higher production value. Another one is, um, and again, there's lots of different op opportunities here for podcast formats. I'm just choosing like a few. So here's one that has the news feature. And I always like to talk about um, the daily because I adore Michael Babaro, but um, here it is. This is a little bit higher production value, but here, here it is. You have a host. He's framing the episode. You know, he comes on, he talks about it. He tells you what you're going to know. You get to have a reporter come on and tell you about the story. You probably have some interviews. Those are character interviews to help build this story out. There's audio that's brought in. It sets the scene. There's, you know, music. There's a lot of people involved in this production. Um, and, you know, most importantly, you have this host who has become, um, you know, he's become the daily. And actually, I have um, a really interesting, if, if you're interested in becoming a host and how you're going to host your own podcast and you want to hear something very fun, there's a um, audio on the Journalism School's website. It's um, Journalism School Talks on mic, it's on mic, and it's how Michael Barbaro found his voice. Super interesting and um, a lot of fun if you're thinking about hmm, how did he become the host and how can I become a host of my own show and what, you know, some of the things that he went through. Anyway, so we want to talk, you know, we're talking about format again, we want to talk about what are the, um, when we're considering this, what are the things that are heavy on production. Heavy on production is how many hours of recording. If you have more than one person speaking, you have a lot of voices. If you're going to have sound design, musical scoring, those are just some of the things, you know, that you're going to want to consider. This is just kind of a summary. Um, hopefully, like, you know, some of these uh, podcasts and you can see like through the spectrum, through the spectrum of production value. Um, like where, which if you're thinking about a podcast, where you might fall. All right. So when you're considering your format and um, some of the things you're going to want to talk about is, um, well, how many, you know, first of all, are you going to produce this? Will you hire it out? How will you, how will you find the right person who understands your vision? Um, are you going to interview guests? Um, are you going to do this in the studio, in remote? How will you schedule these? How will you find, oops, how will you find these people? Um, 
how many episodes are you going to prep them in advance? Are you going to release them? Are you going to, you know, re release them, you know, through a certain period um, where you produce as you go. I mean, really important. The last thing you want to do is produce one and then not show up again. It's a lot of work to do this and you want to keep this going so that your audience stays with you. Um, sound design and music. Are you going to, are you going to have sound design? Are you going to have music? Are you going to do this as yourself? Are you going to rent it out? Are you going to use something that's, um, you know, in Creative Commons? Um, are you going to have a host? Are you going to have a narrator? Um, if you do have a host, uh, it's really important to think about, is this somebody who can really carry an audio show? You want to know, think about launch date. That only, the reason I say launch date is because people are like, yeah, I want to do it. Well, when do you want to start? Well, well, you know, well, if you have a launch date, you have a goal, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to do this. We're going to get it going. What are you going to launch with? Um, this is also something really important. Are you just going to launch with a pilot? Are you going to launch with a, like a little mini version, a little postcard of it? Or are you going to go full out and say, I'm going into it and I'm just going to start, you know, launching um, full fledged shows. And then the budget. You really want to have a good idea up front of what um, your budget, what you want your budget to be. You're going to have to think about equipment. Do you want to purchase equipment? What kind of software do you want to use? If you're going to do your, your own editing, are you going to hire a professional producer? When you start recording, are you going to record um, uh, with a professional audio uh, engineer? Are you going to record in a studio? How are you going to find that studio? You know, so many things. And, and then how are you going to transfer tape? Lots of things to consider here. Uh, marketing and promotion. This is really important. Nobody ever thinks about this. They think if I produce a podcast, everyone will want to listen to it. But it's like every single thing that you ever do. You want to produce videos. You want to write for, you know, write whatever. You still have to market it. You still have to promote it. And honestly, with um, podcasting, it's becoming a little bit easier. Um, because there are so many different um, hosting platforms right now who help with marketing. Um, but some of these things you have to think about. Always have a plan beforehand. How are you going to distribute it? Meaning, what is your hosting platform? Um, you, are you going to have a website? Yes, by the way, you are. Um, how are you going to, um, like, where are you, where are you going to distribute it? Um, by the way, if you have a hosting platform, they give you an RSS feed, the RSS feed then feeds into iTunes and all the major um, uh, platforms for distribution. Let's see. Um, advertising, how are you going to advertise it? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's always a big thing. Are you going to go on social media? Are you going to tell everybody? Are you just going to tell your network? And again, it all depends on what, you know, what is the reason? Why do you want to do this? Um, there are referral programs um, also that often come with um, hosting um, platforms. And, and the other thing is branding. And I can't really stress branding enough. Um, branding is like everything else that you do. You know, when you, when you have a business, you brand your business. You also want to brand your, your um, podcast. And the last thing I would say about that is how are you going to measure success? Okay, that's really important. And um, a lot of the hosting platforms actually are very good now at giving you um, information, you know, analytics and, and other information um, back on the success of your podcast, like how many downloads, how long they listen, what they're listening to, what they're not, so you can adjust that. Okay, the last thing I wanna say is about resources. Um, this is, <laughs> so I was, I was like, oh, my resources, where's my resource list? So of course, um, I would say at, at any time, if you go to Berkeley Advanced Media Institute, look at our tutorials. One of the things we're, we're still a public institution. Um, we were one of the first people actually to start developing tutorials in digital media content production, which is really funny um, because now everybody does it. But um, yeah, we, we produce and we try to keep everything as up to date as possible. Um, we also do training, but um, you know, there's also lots of other resources you can use. Uh, Transom, I think is great. 
as a resource. Um, I also subscribe myself to many different newsletters. Inside Podcasting Newsletter as well as Pod News new Newsletter are also really good. I like that. And I like Podcast Insights, just a lot of information, a lot of data um, that you can use. And last of all, thank you so much. I hope I did my timing right. I'm sorry if I went over. And um, please feel free to reach out to me. It's my first initial last name at berkeley.edu. Thank you so much. Whoops, let me. Thank you, Vicki. So next we're gonna go to someone local, uh, Doug Nunn, who is known to a lot of the people here. Uh, he produces a podcast called uh, Snap Sessions. Since 2018, and he works with Marshall Brown and Ken, no, Ken Krauss, excuse me, featuring interviews with creative people, political commentary, and deep dives into media. He's been involved in improv into improvisational theater since 1980. Doug has coached improv since the late 1980s, working with actors and drama students in the Western US and Europe, most extensively in Germany and Britain. He has produced improv and comedy shows from Mendocino to LA to London, coached the Improv Club at Mendocino High School in Northern California since 2000, and published Show Ab. Oh, you're going to have to say this for me. This is in German. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Show Ab. Um, it's, a it's, a, it's a book for teenagers, uh, teenage improv. That's what it is. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, Doug has been a member of Hit and Run Theater since 1979 and worked as one half of the comedy team Burns and Nunn from 1985 to 1994. He has worked in cartoons, is an animator on The Simpsons film in 2007, and is a scriptwriter. His cartoon Copzilla was an award winner in the 1998 World Animation Festival. In December, he published the Christmas fantastical Jolly Old Elf, The Art of Santa H. Claus, a farcical picture book. Doug has done more than 50 presentations for Al Gore's Climate Reality Project since 2018. So Doug, you have a lot you can tell us, including about the people that you're working with. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and uh, thanks to Vicki and Steve and um, Marinella and everybody. I'm glad to be here. Um, I uh, just wanted to give you a short presentation of via um, uh, Keystone, just a quick sort of PowerPointy thing. So it's okay. Doug, I'll share the screen. Doug, this is Marinella. Yes. Doug, can you um, can you increase your volume because you're coming across sure. very faint? Okay, I'll do that right now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Is that better, Marinella? No, it's yes. about this. Can you hear it better? Because I can. Same? I still hear Is it very faint. Is that better, faint. Marinella? Now it's better. Yes, just now. Okay, great. I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and go with that. Thank you. Okay. Thank so, you. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen if it's okay. And um, let's see here. I've got that. And I'd like to share uh, share a, a short presentation with you. We are indeed uh, the SNAP sessions, and that includes myself. I'm in the middle there, and it also includes Ken Kraus on the left and Marshall Brown, or here, Marshall Brown on the left and Ken Kraus in the center. Um, uh, Marshall Brown is our producer and tech meister. He does the web design and the web upkeep. And Ken Kraus is, uh, does a lot of the voiceovers. He's our segment editor, sound producer, and he's a, basically a sound engineer. And uh, I also do voiceovers, and I do the writing and the interviewing. And uh, so we're the, we're the three of us for Snap Sessions. It was interesting to hear Vicky talk about um, all the different jobs and everything that people have. Uh, we do it all, and we're a little bit like a mom and pop in a teenage son kind of uh, grocery store. Uh, we do everything. We, we, we load the shelves. We do the cashiering. We do everything. So we're always hustling, the three of us. And um, we, we want to give you a little background. Um, Marshall, who is teaching at Mendocino High School, he's the tech teacher. He does the audio, video department, etc. And I had taught with Marshall for some years. In fact, he was an ex-student of mine. 
And uh, when I retired as a teacher in 2008, uh, 2017, in the summer, Marshall said, I handed Marshall a bunch of my old movie and film books and video books. And Marshall said, here's a book for you to read. It was a book on how to do podcasts. And of course, I had inter uh, listened to podcasts, but I had thought, um, I, I, I was very interested and read the book, and I thought, I'd get back to it. Marshall said, maybe me and you could do something together. So I came back with some ideas and thought maybe I could interview uh, fellow artists. I knew a lot of people in show business. I knew a lot of visual artists, etc. And so uh, we thought of that as a basic thing, and then also to do some opinion pieces. Marshall teased me. He goes, you know, Doug, you're always pontificating about something. Now is a chance for you to do it <laughs> in a podcast form. So we started with that. And Marshall and I initially started to try to do it together. And then Ken Krauss, who's my hit and run theater comrade for the last 12 years or so, Ken also does voiceovers and he's a sound engineer. So Ken uh, and, uh, and Marshall and I sort of mutually approached each other and we got Ken on board. And ever since then, we've been working to hammer it out. And uh, it's been a very lively uh, time for the last three years, for sure. Here's our basic goals uh, for our podcast. We like to do interviews with artists. We do uh, political environmental commentary. I work, as I said, for um, Al Gore's group of the Climate Reality Project. It's not urgent. Uh, is somebody talking? I yes. Could I just want to check. Does anybody have the... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I just wanted to say we basically do interviews with artists. We do political environmental commentary. I work with Al Gore's group. Uh, not really work. I don't have a job. I'm an ongoing volunteer and mentor with the group. And so I do a lot of environmental stuff. Uh, as Vicky would understand, I went to UC Berkeley, so it's hard to shut me up in terms of political opinions. And I've always been like that. So that's part of the deal. And we also do what we call deep dives into media. Uh, all three of us love movies. We love comedy. We love music. So we do tributes to various performers, ensembles, movies, and shows. I'll give you some examples here shortly. We also do a segment called Sounds Funny where we talk about various com comedians, comedy groups, or funny musical acts. Here are some of the local people that we have done, local artists that we have featured in our shows and with, with interviews and or tributes. We've talked to James Maxwell. If you look upper right here, this is one of Max's um, paintings with the so-called seagull paintings he did for the old seagull restaurant. This is the Pied Piper, which is one of Max's. We interviewed Max uh, about a year and a half ago uh, for a broadcast. We interviewed Steve Weingarten, also my old hit and run theater friend, who's a sort of a, a ceramic and stone worker. We interviewed uh, Bill Stoneham, bottom right. Bill, That's one of Bill's paintings called um, see the the room whispers to her i think and um bill is a painter who now lives up in washington state uh he's made a living as an artist for years and then the left side is jessica morcell who is the owner of the golden west saloon she's also a fort bragg city councilwoman and she's been a graphic artist for about uh 17 18 years working in pattern designs we interviewed jessica and we've also interviewed a variety of of other people uh, not only locally, but uh, we get around, so to speak. Uh, the left-hand side is our logo maker, Daniel Stieglitz, who's from Kassel in Germany. Um, Daniel is an old improv student of mine. I do uh, coaching tours in Europe. And uh, Dan, Dan is a terrific guy. He's one of those fast caricaturists who can do a caricature in five minutes. And uh, you can sit down in front of Dan. Five minutes later, you can walk out with a caricature. We interviewed him for our show last summer. Uh, he's part of our team. And then upper right is Caitlin Berrigan, who is sort of a, a conceptual artist slash video artist who now lives in Berlin. She grew up on the Mendocino Coast, and I've stayed in touch with her for years. And then bottom right is uh, Evan Mills, who's a scientist from Lawrence Labs in Berkeley who lives in Mendocino. Evan is an environmental scientist and uh, has worked uh, for years. Uh, he worked for the International Panel on Climate Change 
and he was one with that group was a co-winner with Al Gore of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007 for his work on climate change. It's absolutely fascinating interview we did with him and it's in our January episode two months ago. We've also re, uh, done a lot of entertainment. Uh, Left-hand side here is Edie Patterson. She's in our newest episode, which just came out this past week. Beginning, we, Our episodes always come out the beginning Sunday of the month. That's our thing. That's Edie. She's in um, The Righteous Gemstone. She's one of the writers, actresses in that show. And Edie's an old improv friend of mine. Upper right is Will Durst, the uh, political comic from San Francisco, who's done all kinds of touring in uh, all over the world, really, and a Serbic political commentary. And bottom right is sort of the Will Durst of Britain, Mark Thomas, who is a political comic as well. We've interviewed Carol ben Simon. On the left, she's a Brazilian novelist who actually lives on the North Coast here. Bottom right is a British journalist who works for the Financial Times, Peter Chapman, an old friend of mine. And then upper right, this is an interview in progress. This is myself speaking to Peter and Sheila Jowers, who are uh, sort of commune builders and organic gardeners uh, par excellence. They are really uh, fascinating, interesting people. We did an interview with them in last May's episode. Um, really great people. I've known them for years and uh, seen them raise their girls. And they've done all kinds of commune building work in Western England. And they also participated in a BBC show, which was about commune building. We've covered events like the Mendocino Film Festival. This is one from 2017. We actually covered the 2019 Film Festival. And then last year, when there was no festival because of COVID, we uh, put out the episode as sort of uh, to honor the Mendocino Film Festival. As you know, that's sort of on hiatus right now. And uh, we're hoping that it comes back, but we wanted to honor them. And then we covered the opening of the Fog Eater Cafe, which is a small vegetarian restaurant in Mendocino. And I interviewed the people before they opened, while they were opening, and then a couple of months later. And we wanted to follow the, the building of a new restaurant. It just so happens that one of the owners is my stepdaughter, so that was kind of an easy interview. <laughs> but um, anyway, it, it's a, it's, it's, it was a fun sort of thing to follow. And then the bottom right is a group of people with Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. I was trained in 2018 in the summer in Los Angeles. And I went, uh, when I went, I took my little recording, my little Zoom recording device along and I interviewed a bunch of people. I didn't get to interview the big guy himself. Um, he was all a far away, austere figure up there. But um, I did interview a lot of people from Africa, from Mexico, from other places, Britain, from other places in the world. It was a fascinating time for me. And it's led to a lot of interesting things. And we also do uh, goofy stuff. Uh, Ken and I, and Marshall as well, are all, uh, you know, Ken and I work in hit and run theater. So we do a lot of improv comedy these days but over time I've also written a lot of goofy stuff and here's three examples um, we did uh, last May uh, we did a, a episode called seven days in the Mesozoic which is from an old short story I had written it tells the last seven days of the dinosaur Imperium uh, uh, along the lines of the famous film book um, seven days in May about a coup d'etat in the United States and Seven Days in the Mesozoic tells the story of the last week of the dinosaurs before the comet strikes. And um, what's going on is the meat eaters of Dinosauria are pr um, plotting to overthrow the vegetarians. And this tells the whole background story as sort of a radio show. Um, upper right is the uh, story of the Irish persons. The Irish Portions was kind of a subset of Hit and Run Theater, a fake um, Irish political folk group who uh, did all kinds of, they were on the front lines of the anti-nuke movement for years and so on. Um, and it, this tells the story of the refinding of the Irish Persons and what happened to the group, told through the eyes of a fake uh, a folk music uh, sort of uh, culture uh, reporter by the name of Karen Crust. Paid, played by our own Ken Kraus. So that's a 20-minute episode, 20-minute story, a mockumentary. 
And then we have the whole album as part of that. We did eight songs, recorded them in the late 80s, and then we found a couple of recordings. So that was really fun. We did that this Christmas, this past Christmas. And then bottom right is a version of the Nut Clucker, which was uh, Harry Rothman and my production of the Nutcracker Suite done by Chickens. That's uh, Chick Klucksky's Nut Clucker, and that came out in the Christmas of 2019. So that was a fun one to do. So in other words, we, we're, we're, we branch out. We're definitely a, a wide-ranging audio magazine. We also, I mentioned this um, uh, funny, uh, sounds funny, or this, this aspect of our show. We've covered Spike Jones. I don't know, for some of you, as Steve mentioned, for some of you who go way back. Um, I go way back, Steve. I'm with you on this. Spike Jones, I used to listen to and love when I was a kid. My dad played Spike Jones. My grandparents played Spike Jones. Uh, Betty Boop, another one. Uh, I covered. We covered a uh, the story of Betty Boop, which is actually a fascinating political story of the 1930s. Um, she was kind of uh, an oppressed cartoon figure who uh, ended up being sort of not really blacklisted, but uh, definitely they put the clothes back on Betty Boop, so to speak. <laughs> she was seen as a fla flagrant floozy at the time, and uh, the, the first motion picture codes really went to work on here. We've also covered people like Denis Diderot, the inventor of the encyclopedia. It was really fun to do research on him. And then we also do, like I said, uh, political stuff that's more overt uh, political. Uh, we uh, First episode we came out with also had a thing about the GI Bill. Uh, I was fascinated uh, during my childhood hearing my father talk about the GI Bill and the difference it made in his life. My dad graduated from high school in Vallejo, went right to work at the Mare Island Shipyard in 1948 as a welder's apprentice. His family was working class, my mother's family was too. My dad went to Korea in 1950 in the Navy, and four years later he came out and he ended up graduating from UC Berkeley with a degree in electrical engineering in 1958. He made the middle class. It was the GI Bill that did it. And um, uh, this kind of social engineering in American history is much undervalued. And uh, the, doing this story really gave, a, gave you the feeling of what it meant. I, I talked about my father's story in that one. And then, of course, voter suppression, an ongoing theme in American history. Uh, we did a, a expose last May on this. And as Ken reminded me of the other day, we should resurrect that and redo it. Sadly, we should probably do an article on voter suppression every three months in this country. And then we've also looked at American exceptionalism and how that's touted, etc., over time. Upcoming episodes. Uh, we have uh, Michael Jean Sullivan and Valina Brown of the San Francisco Mime Troupe are the interviewees in the next two episodes. Michael Jean Sullivan, the very handsome guy on the left who looks like Harry Belafonte, if you ask me, the young Belafonte. Um, he is a terrific guy. He's the writer in residence at the San Francisco Mime Troupe. As you know, they're a much decorated uh, political theater group in San Francisco, and he's been writing for them for 25 or 30 years. And he is a terrific actor-singer. His wife, Felina Brown, is also a great actress-singer, and she's done all kinds of recording and directing. They're the next two months, April and May. And then bottom left, Dan O'Connor, the guy in the middle who's holding his cufflinks. Dan is from uh, Impro Theater in L.A., so the next three months are sort of theatrically oriented. And then bottom right is Emily Jane White who's a former uh, student of mine, who uh, is now a very famous folk singer. I had no idea. <laughs> These things just kind of pop out. Um, I found out by interviewing Caitlin Berrigan a couple of months ago that Emily Jane has a huge following, and I interviewed her and find out she has five and seven million hits on various of her folk songs. So she'll be out in July. And then finally, I wanted to mention her next to finally here, these are some upcoming uh, articles we're going to be putting out. Uh, one on the filibuster, the history of the filibuster. Of course, this is a very pertinent issue uh, in the United States. And we see Strom Thurmond up there, uh, Mr. Jim Crow himself. The recent hearings at, in the Senate on the impeachment trial were led by Jamie Raskin. We're doing one on the people involved in that. 
Uh, the history of vaccination. Um, there's been, I used to work in the environmental science class at Mendocino High School, and I used to do a vaccination week to find, to talk about pros and cons of vax, to deal with those realities. We've done a huge, uh, I did a lot of research on this one. I'm very proud of this article, which should be coming up soon. An ode to Second City Television from Canada, very funny group. MF Doom, the rapper, who I didn't know much about. Marshall Brown is leading one, uh, a, a, uh, an article on MF Doom. And then the Texas energy crisis. And we're resurrecting an old hit and run character to talk about uh, Tex. His last name rhymes with Ritter, but starts with an SH. So he's going to be doing a little bit of an expose on the Texas energy crisis. Snap Sessions, we do our best to get our the word out. We're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, we're on SoundCloud, we're on Google Podcasts. Um, of course, we would like more people to hear our stuff, but we try really hard. We get it out every month onto those. Marshall is key to this, and he does a lot of the work to smooth our way out onto the, um, onto the general market out there. We... Um, get our supporters, our, um, uh, our various uh, helpers and so on from Patreon, subscribers. Uh, if you become a subscriber to Snap Sessions or a follower, if you would like to call it, you could become a mini snapper at $5 a month or $5 per episode. And you could see you would get a certificate of appreciation as a mini snapper. Uh, uh, right there, or you could become a Snappus Maximus for $35 <laughs> an episode. And uh, we have a few Snappus Maximus people. At this point, I must be honest and tell you that we pay for ourselves. We, we're on Go we have a Google Office suite that we pay for. We have our uh, Patreon. We have Libsyn. We have a variety of other things. So we could definitely use some help. We're looking for sponsors. If there's any amongst you uh, powerful business women of the Mendocino Coast who are interested or back at Lubetkin Enterprises in New Jersey, we would <laughs> gladly welcome further sponsorship or support. Um, we enjoy doing this very much and would like to follow through. So this is who we are. I mentioned myself, of course, and then Ken Kraus, uh, who's in the audience here today. Ken can answer tech questions. Um, he does. He's a great voiceover. As my brother said, Doug, you have an annoying voice, but Ken is beautiful. So uh, he, Ken has a beautiful voice. He yeah. does, and he also a great segment producer. Marshall is a great uh, web design guy. He also does sound and video work. Uh, like you do at Lubetkin back there, Steve. And um, he is he's a terrific all-around guy. Marshall is half our age, but he is a wonderfully biz uh, energetic guy. As I mentioned also, Daniel Stieglitz, our Euro Snap brother, um, he does caricatures. If you are interested in getting a caricature done by Mr. Stieglitz, I can give you information for that. So at any rate, I think that's it. And um, if anybody has any questions, I would gladly join the queue with Steve and Vicki. Thank you very much to Coast Women in Business, Marinella and Catherine and everybody else for having us on and allowing us to be part of uh, the show today. Thank you. Well, thank you. I thank all the speakers. If you've checked the chat recently, we do have questions. We also have some resources and you can save the chat file. So, or sometimes I take pictures of things. Uh, Steve Lebetkin is offering a coupon on his book, The Business of Podcasting, at thebusinessofpodcasting.com. You can get $5 off your purchase of the book. And uh, he has a bit.ly link there directly to it with a coupon code CWIB. So if this has uh, made you think that you might want to dip your toe into podcasting, that's the book to get. It's one of the seminal books in this field. Um, we had some questions about, has anybody actually, can someone talk to using a podcast for your business in a specific way like how have you used it and what kind of results have you gotten steve I, I can jump in on that one of the examples that we use in the book um is the example of a global business to business insurance company that did not uh, have any contact with the consumer market so this wasn't about selling life home auto or, 
or health. It was about selling risk management services for very unique business risks. And uh, they were one of the first companies to launch a cyber liability policy before anybody knew that there was a risk ex associated with, with cyber. Um, and in order to do that, they had a, a multiple channel rollout of a white paper explaining cyber liability, a landing page with brochures and documents about cyber liability. And we did a series of podcast interviews with the subject matter experts on cyber liability. And these podcasts were not about, we have wonderful friendly claims agents, we have great premiums. It was tangible, useful information for corporate risk managers to answer questions about what their exposure to cyber liability was. Do I have the right firewalls on my network? Am I using the proper encryption software? Are my people trained to detect uh, phishing and uh, spear phishing attacks and other kinds of malware, things like that? And what the subject matter expert, the product manager was able to do was say to people, go listen to the podcast and then let's talk. And they got about 13,000 downloads of these podcasts on cyber liability. Um, and that predisposed the people who listened to them. It educated them and it predisposed them to understand what the risks were before they contacted the company to actually talk about buying insurance. And when you take 3,000 or 13,000 half hour conversations about cyber liability that this gentleman didn't have to have one on one with people, that's a significant amount of dollars in his salary that wasn't spent on one on one half hour telephone calls. So, uh, so there's a real value to doing podcasting in a corporate environment that's not associated with generating revenue in a traditional way, but, but may be associated with a halo effect and a predisposition effect to get people pre-qualified to purchase your product or ask about your products and services. Does anyone else from the panel want to comment on that? <clears throat> I don't have anything to add. Well, a related question um, was, what are the benefits of a podcast over a YouTube channel? And this is Ahulani McAdam. I do personal growth monologues and we'll do some interviews. Right now I'm doing Facebook live streaming. Uh, people seem to connect by seeing me, but I don't know the pros and cons of the platform. So what would be an advantage of podcasting over say YouTube or some other video platform? I can, I can talk a bit about that. So, okay. you know, um, actually one of my most uh, favorite courses that I've actually ever attended, as well as um, something we produce is identifying um, what format your multimedia should go into. So for example, if you have something that's highly visual and shows a lot of movement um, that would, you know, would show better if we took the people to that location. Makes sense to make a video out of that, right? Um, but if it's something that you can describe and you can do just through the ear with your eyes closed, then that's a perfect example, an opportunity for a podcast. Um, there's also perfect opportunities uh, for writing, right? Both short form and long form. So, um, you know, one of the exercises uh, that we do is like we say, what's the scenario? You know, let's write down all the visuals that might go with that. And then let's write down all the audio parts of that. And how does this, how does this, um, how does this fit into the proper format, right? So when you ask, you know, um, let me see, you said you're doing Facebook Lives. Um, they seem connected by seeing you. Truly, they could. That could be a great opportunity for your particular audience. What I would ask is, um, could you get more, could you get more um, people to listen to you if you did it with just audio so they wouldn't have to be on Facebook live at the particular time that that you are um i don't actually use facebook live so 
don't quote me. I don't even use Facebook, by the way. You know, may I ask something? Political. Uh, sure. <clears throat> yeah. Um, what I'm curious about, a lot of people uh, just listen. They don't need to watch. And sometimes I'm out and about and so on. But um, I'm really, it doesn't really mean, it's only that I'm using Facebook Live because it's a, it was a visual format for marketing. It did it for a marketing thing, um, which, may, which led to YouTube. Mm -hmm. And people evidently don't necessarily watch. They just listen to the audio on these other platforms, these visual platforms as well. And I don't know if it's an either or thing or not, but I, I appreciate your this way of thinking about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, are they recorded then and anybody can go back at any time and listen to them? Yes. Yeah. And what they let you, well, it's really from Zoom, actually. Zoom streams mm. to these various platforms. So that's what I'm doing. Um, it could just be the audio. I can take the audio track from that, I think, from Zoom and use it. Mm. I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, audio tracks from Zoom aren't great by the way, unless you do it properly, but you could play around with that and see how it works. I'm not saying it wouldn't work, but um, you know, YouTube is a great um, distribution channel. That's all I can say. You know, a lot of people are on YouTube. When you, if you go to a just a podcast format, you'd have to train people um, to find you where you are. Right. And that's part of the market marketing. Um, but I think, um, Steve has something to say about that too. Yeah, I'm, I am um, not a huge fan of sending people away from your content platform to visit YouTube to watch your videos. Um, I know in the social media world, there seems to be some kind of a, a competition about collecting the little badges for all the different platforms that you're delivering your content to. Uh, the problem with sending people to those platforms is you're sending them away from the website where you show them all your knowledge and expertise. And what I encourage clients to think about is, sure, use YouTube as a platform, but learn how to embed the video player in your website so that people don't have to leave your website to watch your videos. Because once they go to YouTube, YouTube is going to serve them suggested next videos and not all of them are going to be appropriate to your clientele they're going to be about your competitors in the same space they're going to be uh videos where people are making fun of your products and services uh, they could be very inappropriate and so what you really want to do is control where people see your content and to me that's placing the players on your page including your podcasts and you can put them on spotify you can put them on an anchor soundcloud Apple, you should be in all those platforms, but you shouldn't be promoting those platforms as the place where people go. Put the player in your site and give people the option to download it from your site. They can subscribe to it from those other platforms, but you shouldn't be sending them away from your site to do that. That's super, thank you. I have a question. Right. Um, oh, did you wanna say something, Doug? I was just going to say that I think both Steve and uh, Vicky made strong points there. Um, uh, I think it's very important what Steve said, get people to come to your site. Uh, please come to the snapsessions.com. That, that type, I think. When I need to do something visually, I do put it on YouTube. I've done a fair amount of climate talks and they, they're slideshows. So basically I put them on YouTube. But the podcasts themselves, I follow along with Steve and Vicky. I want them to come to the Snap Sessions and become fans, regular view, uh, regular listeners. Uh, can any of you, you. Uh, talk a little bit about how you get interviews, especially with notable people? And if you have a few interview tips, we only have a few more minutes, but um, we have quite a few questions, but we also have resources in the chat. But I think some people have asked about interviews. I, I would say just ask people. go ahead, Steve, you talk first. I'm sorry. I would just say 
ask people. If, you, if there's someone you want to interview, um, Google them, find out who the contact information is, and uh, send them an email and say, I'm a podcaster, I have this podcast or this video show, and I want to interview you. People are a lot more receptive to it today. And the PR people who work with the people you want to interview are anxious to demonstrate their value to the to celebrities by getting them on these shows. I was going to say, um, I, I agree with that too. Uh, contact people and, and you, you, you'd be surprised how many people love to give you 20 to 30 minutes of their time, maybe even an hour. Um, I also, I've been very fortunate in that having been, I would consider my life has been in minor league entertainment uh, for the last many years, as well as being a teacher. But the great thing about minor league entertainment is you meet a lot of fairly good uh, talents. And um, I have met, for example, Edie Patterson, who we've interviewed for this month's. I mean, she's, you know, she's kind of an up and coming star. Uh, I've also interviewed a lot of people, Will Durst or Mark Thomas, these kind of people who are actually, uh, you know, they've, they've done a lot of good things and they're quite willing to talk to an old buddy who's uh, been through a few things. And they also sometimes turn you on to other people. Have you talked to uh, person X? And that ends up, you know, leading places. So I'd follow along with Steve's advice, contact them. If they say no, it, it, it's no surprise, and move on to the next guy, next person. Thanks. Um, we have quite a few questions, and we're almost at 9.15, and a few people I know have to leave at 9.30. So would anybody mind if we skip over the networking and do more of the questions or... Uh... Catherine, you're muted. Thumbs up. <laughs> Thumbs up. Okay. Okay. So I'm catching up here on some of the questions. Marinella asked, um, I'm curious whether any of the speakers are trying out Clubhouse, the new audio only social media platform. Uh, anyone have any comments? I, I actually got an invitation to it just recently. So I'm trying it out. Any comments? <laughs> I, I don't know anything about it. I've, I've joined it recently, but I, I can't honestly say that I'm seeing just yet the benefit of it. But I, I also felt that way about Twitter in its early days. And then I figured out how, how useful that could be. So uh, <laughs> jury's still out on, on Clubhouse. I, I recently joined it. Um, and um, I have to say that I was a little, oh, well, OK, now one more platform. However, I was um, following a, uh, a woman who's very um, famous in audio and she has like 19,000 followers already. So, uh, but she also has a lot of followers anyway. Um, I don't know what she's doing on it because um, it's a new platform and I just started it last week, but I think it's, it's gonna be interesting. And if you're early enough in it and you can get the right people and it's your demographic, that's the other thing, is it your demographic? Um, I'd say, give it a give it a try um one thing i wanted to uh i saw somebody asked about recording a, you know how do you record inexpensively i don't know who did who asked that question but um you know that is a really good question you know how could i start a podcast and do that so uh we actually teach people how to do this and a couple, there's a couple of ways that we um, suggest if people are just starting out and you don't know for sure if you're gonna do this and dive right in. You don't know if you wanna hire a professional audio engineer. You don't know if you wanna go to a studio. Um, so one of the ways is on your smartphone. You can do pretty high rec uh, quality recordings on your smartphone with the right microphones and the right setup. It is entirely possible and it does sound pretty good. There's also ways to do remote interviews um, with somebody else with them um, using their smartphone and sending you the file. And that's really important because I know somebody mentioned doing it on, you know, doing something on Zoom, fine, do it on Zoom, but don't use a Zoom recording. That's my uh, suggestion. Then there's also um, audio recording devices from Zoom but that is not the Zoom that is the one we're on right now. So it's audio recording devices on Zoom. And um, one that we use for beginners is the H1N. It works fine. It's like $99 on Amazon. 
Um, although let me warn you, it requires a little mini SD card, which nobody has uh, in their offices. So you do have to get that too. But um, it works as a, you know, in-person uh, recording device. Again, it all comes down to um, what kind of microphones are you going to use? Are you going to use lavaliers? Are you going to use reporter mics? Are you going to use the built-in mic? What, what are you doing with this? Are you doing interviews? Are you trying to collect you know, characteristic and environmental sounds in your, in your area? What are you putting together? So there are pretty inexpensive ways to do this. I would just say um, you just have to be aware. The other thing is um, how are you going to edit this? You know, editing software all over the board. Uh, we use Adobe Premiere, I mean, sorry, Adobe Audition, only because the university gives it to us for free. So that's what we use. But, um, you know, professional podcasters like Doug, I don't know what you use, use Hindenburg, some others. But once you lose, use one editing software, you can use them all. There's free editing software. Um, you know, it's all over the board. But I would say if you're going to start, uh, what I would suggest is, Find somebody who will mentor you, you know, and start that way and start simply. Um, or go find yourself a good production house and let them do it for you. Yeah. Could I add a quick, um, if I could, uh, Catherine, as, uh, I, following along with what Vicki said, Ken Krause, who does a lot of the recording stuff, is here. Ken, are you available to talk? Sure. Um... Okay. Ken does a lot of our stuff, and I want to just po point him uh, quickly to you. Yeah, and and just real, I'll just real briefly do this because you know, text people just glaze up, and they're like, "No, I don't know," and um, it's it's something that um, I have uh, found. For example, if you've got a a uh, Apple computer, you've got GarageBand on there, and GarageBand, in terms of editing as a basic editing software, is serviceable. It will it will uh, it will work for you. Uh, I also just recently got uh, uh, Pro uh, Logic Pro, which is a step up, and it's a little more. Uh, a lot of people use it for music editing, but it's great for doing when you've got different voices at different levels to bring people into a middle ground. It really works very well. Um, I use. A blue microphone, USB mic. It works well. It 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 does really decent recording. Um, but I also use a a professional mic. I I do voiceover, so I use a professional mic in my studio when I do my voiceovers for our podcast. So there's all levels you can get into this at. Doug uses a little portable Zoom uh, recording device that works really well. But I've set up dual mic recording with a mixing board at people's houses. Uh, I have a portable setup that I can set up pretty quickly. Um, and, and, and the Zoom recordings, if you do a Zoom recording, if you have the Zoom Pro, uh, uh, Pro setup, you can do multi-track recordings and that sounds much better than the single track recording, which really tends to muddy up the sound quite a bit. So you can do that. And in these times when we can't get by and, and, and be, be around people, um, it's, it's something that'll work in a pinch. But uh, I always liked when we could get out and actually have people on mics live and, and, and record them. So the technical end of it, you can get as deep as you want, or you can just go real simple and you can come up with a serviceable thing. One thing about the different platforms is if you have video, use the video to promote your podcast. Don't use it as a, as a standalone thing. I think that uh, most people listen to podcasts, um, you know, when they're driving, when they're exercising, when they're doing something else, and uh, they don't listen to the whole podcast all at once most of the time either. That's another thing to keep in mind. You know, you think people are going to sit down and just listen to your podcast? Probably not. And also listen to other podcasts. Listen to a bunch of podcasts and see what's out there. You'll get some ideas from that. It's very inspiring when you do that. But if you're not familiar with podcasts, that's a good place to start. Start listening to them. And um, you'll find some stuff that'll help you to get ideas for your, uh, for your, it's a storytelling medium too. If you're a business person, you've got a story. You've got a story about your business. So tell that story. It's not a long form commercial. It's a way to put, your story out in front of people and engage them, get them interested in your business. 
Can I just add one quick uh, thing, uh, Catherine? Thanks, Ken. I wanted to add regarding um, putting putting these together um, on the uh, sort of spontaneously. When COVID hit last year, um, uh, about a month later, I wanted to put together this one I mentioned to you guys, the Irish persons, the story of this lost folk group. And um, I had to contact all the people who were in the Irish persons at various distances. One of our main guys was in Florida now, uh, various others around California, etc. So I had people, they recorded, they recorded their parts in a voice recorder on the iPhone. They recorded their parts um, online. They went on the phone, etc. We managed to piece together that particular recording. I managed to collect all the voices for the script, handed it over to Ken, and Ken managed to take all these different formatted voices, put them together, arrange their levels, etc., so that they worked. And I think it was, in a way, it was like giving Ken a brutal um, you know, bachelor's degree uh, problem. He had a project, and he managed to put it together, and it turned out to be a 20-minute mockumentary. So anyway, it's surprising what you can do with all these little things, you know, all these different formats, etc. Uh, where there's a will, there's a way, kind of, I think, in this particular one. We have a, a business question here, I think that may be important to get to from Clara Shook. Have any of the panel members opted or considered paid ads in their podcast shows, either from local businesses or national organizations? Does anyone wanna address that? I can say that for right now, for sure. We would love more sponsors. If there are any coastal women in business who would <laughs> like to help sponsor the SNAP sessions, we would be delighted. So yes, you know, like I say, we have uh, different people who are helping um, to support or to subscribe to our uh, group followers, and um, we we could use more, and we definitely would like that. So, yes, we're soliciting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I encourage everybody to look at the chat because we have had resources that all the panelists and some other people have put on the chat. Um, trying to see if there's anything that I've really missed here. There's a lot of resources, so be sure to download the chat. Um, does anyone want to say more about suggestions about marketing and how to find your target audience? I'm looking at Steve and Vicky, hoping that they'll <laughs> say something brilliant so I can scribble it down. <laughs> I think the kind of podcasts that we're producing are, are not, marketing is important, but that's something that the clients tend to have under their wing. Um, we're, we're producing business content for business podcasts, and the podcasts are part of an overall marketing strategy. Um, to promote the company's expertise and the company's uh, subject matter knowledge. So, so we get less involved in that part of it. Um, I, the one thing I will say about advertising is that for most podcasters um, a, a, among the people who are listening to this program, the business model for advertising doesn't work very well because you need literally tens if not hundreds of thousands of downloads of your podcast in order to make it interesting to most major advertisers you might pick up the one or two people locally um you know the local coffee shop or the local flower shop or things like that but i don't know if they're ever going to be worth enough money to you to uh, to cover the costs that you're incurring in producing your podcast so if you're doing it as a, as a hobby or as an avocation, then it's a nice little extra piece of business. But um, for most people, the, the advertising model isn't gonna work very well. Are there any other models you'd recommend that you've used, like marketing, uh, sponsorships or partnerships? Um, yeah, the, the sponsor, getting people to sponsor a podcast series can work. Um, you know, there are larger companies who are willing to underwrite the cost of a series of podcasts. And that's how we make a lot of our money is, is uh, production services. Okay. I would say that, you know, for in, let's just small businesses, um, marketing, 
or finding your audience. So generally small businesses or people, I think on this call, you know who your audience is, you know who is interested in the, in the work that you do. Um, you know, there's, uh, like Steve said, you know, paid advertising is expensive. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But um, I think there's a lot of very organic ways that you can go about, about marketing once you know who, you're who you want to market to. For example, um, you're, you're probably not marketing to children. You're probably marketing to you know, adults of a certain age group who have certain interests. Um, and you can start by organically doing this um, on social media, if you have social media channels. Um, you can do this through, you know, email marketing. Honestly, uh, Berkeley AMI, when we started, we had no budget, zero. In fact, we almost have zero budget right now as well. And everything we do is organic. We do it through SEO of our website. Um, we don't use social media because I won't use Facebook, um, but um, we do it through um, our, our email marketing and our website and also through LinkedIn organic. And that is actually um, really valuable for us because we have a professional audience. Um, if you're, if you're looking for a, uh, let's say a regional audience, I mean, is anybody looking for a regional audience or are you looking for a global audience? Are you looking for people in the United States? You know, it really depends on what you're going for. I, I always say, if you're looking for a global, a global audience, um, start local and grow <laughs> unless, unless for some reason you've got a great partner who's going to help support you um, globally. But um, yeah, there are lots of different, lots of different avenues. And the most important thing is like to start figure out what do you want out of these people? Where do you actually want to drive them to? Like we've talked about, you know, don't drive them to YouTube. Do you want to drive them to your website? What's on your website? How are you going to keep them there? And what do you want out of them once they get there? And then go from there. Also, as a digital marketing person, I wanted to add that um, you can start with whatever statistics are already available to you. If you have a website, look at who's visiting your website, look at who's commenting, if you allow comments on your blog posts, for example, um, and you can get demographics from that. If you have a Facebook page or any other social media, again, look at the analytics and then you extrapolate and you set up a marketing plan. Um, I can help you with that, but uh, West Center also has some really great advisors and, um, and uh, training um, in the Mendocino County and, and Lake County area. Basically you start with your assumptions and then you validate them just, just as if it's a, you know, a, a science project. And I agree with Vicki, you start locally, you start with people who either know you personally or have heard about you, and then you grow. And you try to just focus on a couple of market segments. And, and then, you know, as you grow your audience, you can get more ambitious and do a more ambitious marketing plan for, for next year. Keep in mind that the statistic for conversion on a website, for example, is only 1% typically. So, you know, um, you do need to have quite a bit of traffic to, to get uh, a consistent loyal base, but it can happen. You know, uh, if you have uh, content that's engaging, that's um, interesting or humorous or motivating, whatever your, your approach is. I, I need to interrupt because Steve needs to go. He I has. Gotta go. I got a client waiting for me in the. <laughs> Bye, in the Steve. Zoom room. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so all. much. I want to say uh, thank you to all our speakers. What were you going to say, Steve? I was just going to say um, if anybody has any questions, they can contact me. I'm happy to talk. Right. And the coupon for your book. So everybody who, who wants to really yes, look please. into. Yeah. Great. A great offer. One more um, shot of the book. 
We're almost at 9.30, and I think Marinella also has to go. Uh, I want to, again, thank all the speakers and for all of you who've come. I hope everybody's learned a lot. I've learned a lot from this. And so uh, thanks again. And next time we're going to do one on video. Uh, does anyone want to say something brief, Mar Marinella? Yeah, before you go yeah I, I can mention it. So it is going to be April 8th, uh, pretty much the same top, same kind of, um, we're getting in how to market your business with video on April 8th at 8 o'clock. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. It was Thank a pleasure so to be involved. Thank, we'll you. Post, Thank you. Thank you. We'll post all resources to our website, so please check the blog section. Thank you. Everyone, wonderful meeting.